My take on the amendum thing uh, starts from the assumption that he's sincere, that he means everything that he says. And uh, when you start from that point of view, I think that his position becomes a lot clearer and easier to sort of put together uh, coherently. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm saying that his position makes sense, mind you, unless you happen to have his point of view of things. If you don't have his underlying assumptions, then I don't think you're going to be able to agree with uh, his conclusions. Now, that's okay. That doesn't mean that his point of view is erroneous or uh, flawed or anything like that, at least any more than anyone else's is. For example, um, I come at my philosophizing from a, a fundamental uh, position of innate curiosity. Uh, I am incredibly curious. I'm curious about everything. Um, I want to know everything that there is to know. I know I'm never going to, uh, but to me the world is just an endless series of experiences, um, some of them good, some of them bad, which are not to be taken terribly seriously because at the end of the day I'm going to be snuffed out and I'll be nothing. Um, <coughs> or at least in terms of my relationship to the reality that I'm living in now. Whatever reality I pick up along the way in this particular lifetime is probably not going anywhere after I die. <laughs> Even if I, or whatever I-ness happens to fundamentally exist, is going to somehow live on or whatever. Whatever I'm doing here in this world is not going to carry on. That's my, I don't know, I guess that's an assumption, that's an axiom that I have. So nothing that happens here is to be taken terribly seriously. But just because you don't take something serious doesn't mean that you're not fascinated by it. Uh, the, uh, just because you don't believe in something's ultimate reality doesn't mean that you are not curious about it. Um, I like fiction. I read all kinds of books about things that I know never happened. Um, uh, yet, I am fascinated because uh, I'm curious. I like the way the plots go in the books. Uh, so that's the way I tend to approach the world. Um, I'm aware of the killing fields of Cambodia. I'm aware of the degradation of the environment. I'm aware of the Holocaust. I'm aware of the atom bomb. I'm aware of uh, any number of horrible things that are happening in this world. I'm aware of our cosmic insignificance. Um, does this color my view of my own existence? Yes, it does. Does it do so decisively? No. My fundamental point of view is that life is fascinating and it's fun. Okay, um, that is irrational. Okay, it cannot be logically explained why I see the world that way. Um, why I think that uh, existence and life and everything is actually worth all the headaches. Uh, I can't make a case for that. <laughs> or at least I can't make a rational case for it. I can make a pretty irrational case for it. Uh, in the same way as I believe Gary is making an irrational case for his point of view. Um, but again, assume sincerity and it makes sense. I think that it goes to the fundamental nature of what we know belief to be. Do you choose your beliefs or do your beliefs precede any sort of choice? Are your beliefs something that's innate in you or do you have some control over them? Uh, I don't know. Uh, there are certain things out there that seem pretty immutable. Uh, for example, I think that Gary's position is pretty immutable, at least in terms of my ability to do anything about it. Um, that's fine. Um, you know, again, uh, what, what vested interest do I have in how he thinks? Um, and by the same token, I think that a lot of the objections that I will come up with to his arguments are fundamentally irrational as well. Because I believe that, I don't know, uh, this plane of existence is kind of fun. It's a, The universe is a fascinating playground. It's got horrible things in it. Uh, but it's also got fascinating and wonderful things in it. Um, now, how do you explain that rationally? Um, you can't. So, I think that the best way to deal with uh, debates like this is to understand that 
each side is coming at it from a set of preconceptions, I guess, um, an irrational uh, set of preconceptions, uh, the set of desires, I suppose, um, and a little bit of empathy, if I may poach my previous video, uh, it comes in handy. Um, there's a story by Thomas Ligotti called uh, Nethoscurial, where, I don't know, it, it looks as though some guy discovers that the fundamental principle behind everything, be, behind physics, behind uh, the universe itself, is the, the ultimate spirit, the animating spirit of the entire cosmos, is evil. <laughs> uh, evil suffuses everything. Now imagine actually coming across irrefutable evidence that this is actually true. Uh, <laughs> what would that do to you if you came across concrete proof that the spirit of the universe <laughs> uh, was malignant, was bad to us, was hostile to humans? What, how would that color your view of things if you if you actually did believe that you had evidence to that effect? <laughs> um, I think that it would create a great sense of urgency uh, that something should be done about that, i.e. the abolition of the universe. The abolition of the universe as we know it. Uh, because ultimately all you're doing by, by doing anything is perpetuating something that is fundamentally evil. That's not what I believe in Mendham is preaching. But what I'm saying is he's got a point of view that a lot of people might find extremely negative. But I believe that he has um, come across enough evidence to be satisfied with the veracity of his own uh, position. And I respect that. Um, I don't subscribe to that point of view. Um, but a lot of the reasons why I don't subscribe to that point of view are admittedly irrational in much the same way as I'm convinced his point of view is fundamentally irrational. Um, irrationality is, I guess, part of what we are. Uh, we are not necessarily rational beings. Um, I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that that means that we're defective in any way, or at least we're not defective as, as compared to what we can reasonably expect ourselves to be. But I think you're going to run across extremely fundamental disagreements like this. Um, personally, I find this philosophy absolutely fascinating, riveting even. Um, I hate to say this, but I use them as a foil, uh, as a devil's advocate. Um, I think that there are a lot of people out there that actually do that, um, but at least I guess that's better than treating him like a circus freak, which a lot of people do, and which accounts, I guess, for a lot of his hostility and abuse and everything like that. I, you know, I wouldn't like to be treated like that either for things that I sincerely concluded were valid points of view. Um, <clears throat> but it's interesting to see someone argue a case like that with such vigor and such persistence over a long period of time. And, again, that's, I guess, to me, that's another one of the fascinating things in this universe, is that there are people that will have points of view that differ so wildly from my own. Now, admittedly, I'm coming at this from, I don't know, I guess maybe a somewhat inoculated point of view. Um, I think where his point of view might be a little bit less than just fascinating, or perhaps a little more than just fascinating, is people who might fear that what he is saying might be the case, but they don't want it to be the case, so they have to argue against him to disprove what he is saying. That can, I think, be damaging to other people, but, well, other, you know, again, I'm going to get on the internet and I might be having the same effect on other people. Um, my point of view could be extremely disturbing to some people. I've had people tell me, uh, apparently in all sincerity, that they believe that I am pure evil. Uh, I believe people when they say that, when I hear things like that. Uh, it fascinates me. That, that, that's one of the more fascinating things that have ever happened to me, <laughs> uh, is that people believe I'm pure evil. But they must have reasons for thinking that way. 
uh, probably because they fear what I have to say, probably because my message is somehow threatening to their point of view. For the life of me, I can't see how my point of view is a dangerous or subversive one, but to some people's worldview, apparently it is. I have to allow them that latitude, and I only hope that people who are extremely fundamentally disturbed by what I say don't watch any of my videos. Um, that's my view of Gary. Um, he's a fascinating person. Um, and while I'm glad he's around, I can say I wouldn't want to be him. I wouldn't want to have that point of view. As I say, uh, it strikes me as just guilt gone completely amok, both of the inflicting kind, he seems to inflict guilt upon everything, upon the cosmos itself, and upon himself, I guess, because again, that's where the sincerity comes in. Every bit of guilt that he inflicts on everyone else, he believes, you know, himself to be a part of it, and yada yada. Uh, so yeah, I think that his point of view is a valid one, and for my part, I'm not so much interested in refuting what he has to say as I am in um, working out alternatives uh, that kind of fit in with my preconceived view of the universe, <laughs> uh, which is essentially what we all do anyway. I believe that he's coming at his own argument in the same way. So I'm going to proceed with my own argument, my own narrative, my own um, view of things in much the same way as he does. Um, he has certain preconceived notions that he brings to the to his arguments. Again, uh, that accounts, I think, for a lot of the inconsistencies that people see in his arguments. And just because it's uh, just because something is wildly inconsistent doesn't mean that it's not sincerely held. And I will say that that's the same thing from my point of view. Um, if we saw the world through his eyes, we would believe what he believes. If people saw the world through my eyes they would believe what I believe. Uh, I don't think that we can be condemned simply for being what we are. <laughs>